Okay, we've got Julian Shabazz up. Julian, what's going on? Greetings and salutations, gang. I'm ecstatic to be on the show. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're glad to have you on the show. And hey, we're Brian. Gonna to hey, how's it going? Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about um, African Americans and pro wrestling, and you probably know this, but um, I guess, you, you, does your book, I mean, actually, I, I, read, I read pretty much most of your book, and you talk uh, originally about, like, Vito Small, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, let me tell everyone about Vito Small, because I'm sure... Almost nobody listening knows who Vito Small is, but he was actually a pioneer of professional wrestling back in the 1800s. Right, right. Well, Dave, before I say anything, let me just preface that I would not be here if it were not for the work that you and so many others have done over the years. You took a lot of heat. You broke the wall down, to paraphrase Chris Jericho's theme, to uh, in terms of allowing outsiders like myself to come in and write about professional wrestling. So I have nothing but praise for you on that point. Now, Thank Vero Small, I'm sorry, you're, you're quite welcome. Vero Small was actually from my home state, South Carolina. Uh, he began, he was an ex-slave who began his wrestling career in 1881. He was an ex-slave from Buford, South Carolina, who traveled back and forth to New York. He was a really affable individual from what I understand, and a lot of the people liked him there, and he was working on a, as a Pullman porter, if you will. And, um, and one time a professional wrestler did not show up for one of the shows where Vero was unloading the uh, train cars. And so he was a pretty big guy. They asked him if he'd be willing to fill in for the guy. He lost the match, obviously, but a professional wrestler out of Vermont named Mike Horrigan, a white guy, saw him. This was April of 1881, and he saw him, and he took him on the road with him. Vero Small is the first black professional wrestler that I'm aware of, and he began his career in 1881. Um. Now, over the years, let's talk about the first, you know, uh, so a lot of listeners of this show and, and modern, not just wrestling fans, but sports fans in general, the plight of the black athlete, I mean, it's, it's you know, if you look back historically, you look back and you go, I mean, how in this country, or any country for that matter, did things that happened, I mean, as late as, you know, the 50s, you know, and probably even after the 50s in some in some cases, but certainly in, in regular sports, whether it was, you know, the, the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, we most publicized. I mean, you couldn't actually be in those sports uh, at the Major League level if you were African American. And in pro wrestling, I mean, what was, you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm trying to think of like uh, where uh, black stars first got started. I mean, were there always? Was there? I mean, I know that there were places, because even in the days of Bobo Brazil, there were places where he couldn't wrestle a white wrestler. He could only wrestle black wrestlers. And then there were some places where, where he wasn't, he were some, some circuits that would not book him, even though he was a superstar. And what was, what was the plight like in different parts of the country, you know, as far as, like, people getting in? Because it wasn't, it wasn't that many years ago, I mean, where... Uh, you know, to be black was like your, uh, was like a gimmick in wrestling. In fact, it's only in the last two or three years that it's not. <laughs> That's, I, I like the way you worded that, Dave. That's the truth. I never thought about it like that, but you're but you're absolutely right. Uh, but yeah, um, in so many parts of the country, particularly in the South, in the Midwest, in various parts of the country, black wrestlers absolutely uh, could not wrestle against white competitors. Absolutely not. Promoters just flat out would not book black wrestlers. Um, in, in some places. Now, California uh, was known for um, having a lot of interracial matches because it just wasn't, they didn't seem to have the same hang-ups in California and on the West Coast that, that people over in the South seem to have, and as well as in, in the heartland of America, the Midwest and places like that. But uh, uh, Woody Strode, who was instrumental in integrating professional football uh, the modern era of professional football, as well as being a pioneer in professional wrestling, as well as being a black pioneer in Hollywood, in the films. Woody Strode tells the story of once when he was wrestling in Texas. He was actually wrestling against a white guy. And at that time, black wrestlers could only be baby faces. Absolutely, they would not let black wrestlers be heels. No way. Promoters feared that there would be a riot if, if a black guy was a, a heel and he was beating up on a local white fan favorite. But Woody said he was wrestling in, in the 1940s in Texas, and he noticed at some point during the match that the referee was carrying a blackjack and a pistol. And at the end of the match, oh he, yes, a blackjack and a pistol. At the end of the match, he found out from the referee that the blackjack and the pistol was for his protection. They were afraid that those rowdy.
rowdy Texans would attack him, even though he was a babyface. So this was the kind of attitude that promoters dealt with. Even even in 1960, Bearcat Wright had a long a long program going with Walter Killer Kowalski. You know that guy. That guy. And Killer drew money in many places. And Bearcat and Killer were drawing money with this great feud they had. They went over to Indiana to take that feud there, and the promoters would not allow integrated matches in Indiana. So Bearcat, right after his match, he stood up in the middle of the ring and said, this was 1960, he would never wrestle in a segregated ring again. He was banned by the State Athletic Commission. The NAACP came out in support of him. And in 1961, he became the first black wrestler to hold a version of the world title when he won it in Tony Santos' promotion in uh, New England. But here, Bearcat Wright really really wasn't fighting for racism as much as he was fighting for his place on the card. You know? Here he was, a main event feud in one state, and you go to the next state and you can't do it because of your skin color. So it was very good the way you put that. Blackness had been seen as a gimmick, if you will. One of, one of my friends uh, growing up who lived in Atlanta in the 60s, uh, said that one of the that they felt that that pro wrestling actually uh, was how I'm sure how, how, we, how we would put it well, but it was probably the most from a fan standpoint the most integrated of sports the Atlanta City Auditorium wrestling because uh, they could have uh, and they had they had black wrestlers they had Mexican wrestlers the Torres brothers um, and they had white wrestlers and they were and and it didn't matter. What color they were? He said, like it was the it was like a place where and, and and this sounds so silly that we even bring it up because it would be so obvious today. But in those days, it was so rare that an audience could be half black, half white, and all cheering for a black baby face <laughs> and with no regard for their skin color. Right. Whereas in he said, like in other sports, even in the '60s, I mean, when you had. Um, even like uh, in Atlanta with Hank Aaron, who was you know uh, you know superstar baseball player, one of the all-time greats, said that like a, a lot of the white fans were not not that they booed Hank Aaron, but they didn't they you know he never really uh, was cheered and accepted in the Atlanta community in right. at least at that point in time uh, commensurate let's say with his statistics and his ability. That's right, and that's where I give the the credit. To the promoter in that area, I wish I knew who the promoter was for that. You well, know, during it, 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 was, it was Paul. I guess it was Paul Jones. I guess Paul Jones. Was okay. Remember. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and in Houston, Texas, Paul Bosch, the promoter down there, was really known for uh, pushing a lot of black wrestlers. Uh, some of those guys, they they saw the money that could be made, and they were very good at promoting black wrestlers and Asian wrestlers and uh, wrestlers of Hispanic descent, uh, and and they were they were very good at it. You know, that's where I give the credit to the promoters. In some cases, the promoters just used their own racism, and they couldn't see beyond that. But uh, in, in other cases, you had a lot of good promoters, like Paul Jones, like Paul Bosch. Even Vince McMahon Sr. used a lot of black female wrestlers at a time when black female wrestlers were rarely used anywhere. You know, it, it, with Paul Bosch, you know, we're bringing that name up. One thing about Paul Bosch that's, that to me is very impressive is that he was one of the few promoters um, who would, you know, would use, um, what, 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 if, if a guy was, in his, eyes, in his eyes, a star, and, you know, he could be from Mexico City, he could be from, you know, from <laughs> anywhere, and he could be any race, and Paul Bosch would put him and push him. I mean, he would bring, you know, like, like an American promoter uh, wouldn't bring, say, an El Santo or Mel Moskris in and put him in the main event and put him over in the main event as the top baby face on the show, uh, just because in their own mind, uh, they're not, you know, they weren't Americans, and God, we see that today, right? Oh, and Paul, Paul, Paul Bosch drew sellouts with with El Santo. I mean, Mil Moskris, when Mil Moskris would come up from Mexico to work Houston, Texas, just as an example, he was always in the main event, and he always drew, as opposed to other cities where, you know, they would, you, know, you could say, yeah, well, Me Houston had a lot of Mexican fans, and that's and that's part of the reason. But there's a lot of cities with a lot of Mexican fans today, you know, where WCW and WWF, for that matter, um, you know, will not. You know, they will not market to that audience. Paul Bosch marketed. I, I mean, he if, if you were a star, if you were a star in Mexico, he didn't just look down on you and go, ah, "That's Mexico. It means nothing here." He would he would take you and go, "This guy is a superstar in Mexico," and the American fans would go, "Hey, he's a superstar in Mexico. He must be good." And the guy drew money on top with 
All audiences. That's a very good point, Dave, and that's why I give the credit to those promoters who weren't so myopic in their own thinking when they were programming for large audiences of people. I, I've heard many great stories about Paul Bosch and, and other promoters, as well as I've heard some horror stories uh, about various promoters, but that's a very good point, Dave. Sure. I want to get to a couple of emails. One actually intrigued me. This is from Jackson who said, is there any chance the WF will have Chris Jericho be the guy who hit Austin? You know, I never thought of that. Uh, Jericho is going nowhere fast. Although if they and if they don't do something quick, he's going to die in the mid card. Although I'm sure that that's what X Pac and Road Dog have in mind. <laughs> did we ask the question about the legalities if maybe Benoit did it? Um, there is no legality. They could say it if they want. Because he would have been in the other company at the time. He would have been in the other company at the time, but you could you could do it. There's no reason that you couldn't. Hmm. There's no legality against it. Uh, this is from Charles Parker, who says, I was listening to the show, and during the commercial break, I heard the guys from the Skybox making the jokes about the difference between the NFL and the XFL. The joke was, the, in the XFL, using a knife would be encouraged, as opposed to the NFL, where choke slams are illegal. I think that Vince has a larger image problem to overcome than I previously thought. Yeah. Vince, Vince has an image problem a little bit. This is from Blair who says, uh, I think that if, we, if a wrestler is injured and is medically unable to perform for the company, his or her pay should be cut in half. If I'm a promoter paying for the services of an individual, and if that performer can't do the job, he shouldn't receive full, full pay for doing nothing. On the other hand, if a wrestler is involved in any way on television, doing run-ins, cutting promos, or participating in an on-camera role, he or she should certainly receive full pay because the wrestler is performing for the company. I would also think a wrestler should receive full pay while injured if they were doing off-camera promo work or doing appearances representing the company. The bottom line is, if the wrestler is working for the company, limited or not, they should receive their full pay. If they're sitting at home collecting a check, why should they get their payment in full? What's the motivation for coming back to work, especially if you work in a company like WCW? Well, part of that's WCW's fault for having no motivation for guys to come back to work. Um, I would say that there might be an argument if you have a guy who, let's say a guy is injured, um, and I mean, now if you're in a wheelchair injured, I would say this is not a this is not an argument. But if you're injured, like you know, you've got a to say a torn rotator cuff like Ric Flair, okay? It's like you know you can't wrestle, and you're not going to be able to wrestle for a couple months, and they don't want to put you on TV because that you can't wrestle, and they ask you to go and do like you know um, autograph signings. Let's just say that the surgery was on your your left your your bad hand and not the hand you write with, because if it was on the hand you write with, then that's something else too. And you say, no, I don't feel like doing any stuff for the company. I, I can see the point. Mm. But, but, you know, if you say, no, I'm not going to do something. But, I mean, if you're, you know, a, a good employee who's willing to come to TV to cut promos. I mean, I mean, just an example. I mean, like the Conan example or even the Bret Hart example of a guy who's, you know, they're on TV. I mean, they can't wrestle in a match, but they're on TV and they're going there. I mean, and even if they're off a show... Like uh, like Flair was, like Hart was. I mean, they were off shows because the bookers had no I didn't tell them to come. I mean, it wasn't like they said, you know, they called them up and go, "We want you to do the show. We want you to do these dates." And they just go, "No, I'm hurt. I'm not coming to TV. Just to do a promo." Now then, you know, then there's then there's an argument. Did Flair get so, his pay cut? I don't believe so. Hmm. Uh, because I don't think he was injured for long enough. I think that there's like they don't do it for the first ninety days. Ninety, yeah. So that's that's why. Well, the least they owe Flair is to let him get his money with all they've done to him over the past couple of years. <laughs> Dave, Dave, hey, Brian, Dave, I'm from South Carolina. I grew up in Jim Crockett Mid-Atlantic Territory. Ric Flair is a god to me and mil millions of other fans. He is. And you have seen them try to make him mortal for how many years now? I have seen them make him <laughs> less than mortal donkeys behind out of Ric Flair over the past several years. Oh my God! And, and you were you were talking we were we were talking before we went Brian you know before we go Brian, I mean I know that you're too young to to know about or to have lived through this and, and actually I am too, but doesn't it like okay doesn't it just like when you when you actually hear the stories about the 50s and even certainly the early 60s I mean um, and I mean things you know things went on in wrestling you know you know even in probably to an extent right now we've got there's a lawsuit out there which which tells you that things aren't exactly 100% now, and the minute that lawsuit came out, all of a sudden, WCW <laughs> started promoting an awful lot of people all over TV. <laughs> I mean, the cat became a main eventer, Booker T became a world champion, CB Ray became a color commentator, all at once. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, that, that is a very good point. Carrot. 
Miss jo Miss jo Yeah, but I don't understand Miss Jones at all. Just I'm, I'm sorry. What, what was that? What did Brian say? Uh, oh, Miss Jones became character. He, he's I, right. I, You're right, Dave. Now, let's see, there, there, in the art of war. You have to fight so that you try to win. If your opponent knows the way you're going to fight, you have to come in a different direction. With the lawsuit out there going, with other things out there going, I came in a different direction with my book, Black Stars of Professional Wrestling. I, and I think anyone who gets beyond the title and actually reads the book will see that it's really not a discourse, uh, it, and it's not an, a vilification against any promoter or any booker or anyone who said American fans only want to watch American wrestlers. You know, nothing like that. It's really really more or less a tribute to uh, black professional wrestling right. from time immemorial, from, from the past on up to today. But you're exactly right. After this lawsuit, and, and I hope my little book helped to in some way, shape, form, or fashion, but yeah, here's the Nitro Girl Chameleon, now she's Miss Jones. Here's uh, uh, Charmel, Nitro Girl Storm, now she's Paisley. Here's the cat who was a boob to Eric Bischoff. All of a sudden, he becomes the commissioner. Commissioner. So yeah, and, you and, guys and, are telling the truth. Yeah, and, and total total top babies. You were talking about. Are there any you know promoters? Um, I mean, I, I I'll throw out a name that that when I was a kid, I mean, it was one of those things where almost never. And I'm sure you could you know I know Rufus Jones worked the territory and, and all this, but Vern Gagne. Never promoted. I mean, virtually never promoted black wrestlers. There were almost never black wrestlers in that Minneapolis territory, and I think, you know, Vern. Oh, there was a guy. Oh, I, I remember this now. That um, Tony Atlas went to the AWA. This would have been in the 80s already, and Tony Atlas would get. Tony Atlas got over really big, and then they basically jobbed him out. And Vern's thing when it was over was. Well, you know, we tried again, and these guys just can't get over in our territory. <laughs> 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 um, and, and, and you know, there—I mean, there, there were there were other—I mean, I'm sure there were other promoters like that. But I mean, I just remember, like, as a kid, you know, AWA was a major league territory. I mean, big money oh, yeah. territory. And I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, he had his idea of what a wrestler should be too, and and somehow. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yes. Kind of I mean, and I have absolute respect for Vern and his talent in the ring and what he accomplished with the AWA and as a prof as a as an amateur as well as as a professional. But uh, you're exactly right. I have made that point repeatedly that the AWA never never had a single black champion in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Ever. They never did even 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 the tag teams. Wow. Not that I can recall. But you're I mean, right. I yeah, obviously, I don't, I don't get jobs. I don't recall. I mean, but they were—they would go long periods without even one black wrestler, and then occasionally they would have them. But um, they were never pushed as hard as like in some other places. Now, um, what? I mean, have you, were there ever? I, I can tell. I mean, just 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 for me, I, 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 when it comes to this, there was one thing that happened. This is in 1990. I was in Japan for a couple weeks, and I, I saw a lot of good wrestling in Japan. Flew in, actually got home uh, about one. A half hour before WCW Saturday Night started, so this is June 1990. Turn on the set, and it's Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, I forget whoever the heels were, and and it was an angle with the Rocky King. I'm sure you growing up there, you remember it. And one of them, I think it was Oli, I'm almost sure it was Oli, says, "We don't even want your kind, or where we come from, you know, they don't even let your kind in." And I was just like, I remember I turned off the TV. After seeing all that great wrestling in Japan for a week, and I just go, what? I mean, like, this is what our, you know, I'm, this is what our wrestling in our country still is in 1990. I was so, I was so mad. You have no idea. It, it, it was like a culture shock, wasn't it, Dave? <laughs> well, I mean, I just was surprised that they would do that in, in, I was just surprised that they would they would do that because this was already after you know at a point where stuff like that wasn't even happening in professional wrestling anymore and and right. I think Oli became a booker and Oli went back to the seventies because that was the era he knew and that's how he got heat you know in the old Carolina territory but here it was nineteen ninety I'm going like you know you're kind and boy and it's nineteen ninety well, and I was like huh. Well, you got to remember, Dave, I'm from South Carolina. I routinely see Confederate flags around here. If, and only in those guys, that was the Mid-Atlantic Territory. Those guys traveled these roads, you know, many years. So they, they figured that they knew the population and what they wanted here. Un, un, unlike, you know, uh, WWF and some other areas, uh, different parts of the country, but these guys figured that that's what, that's what it took to uh, get, get a character over or to get heat. For a character, and they and quiet as it is kept, it is still done today. Yeah, it, last year, last yeah. year, Buff Bagwell 
did a mockery of Ernest the Cat Miller where he came out in blackface. Two years ago, the Degeneration X came out mocking the nation of domination in blackface, wearing afro room. wigs and things like that. That's still going on right now. Jeff Jarrett, a southern guy, a white guy from the south, will literally take a guitar and beat the sh hell out of a black woman on national well, television. Well, didn't Jeff Jarrett call somebody, call Booker T. Boy not all that long ago when he was beating him up? Like, a, a, I forget which, it was a show within the last month or two. He slammed the car door in his leg, I think. When he slammed the car door on the, on the pay-per-view, yeah. Big Papa Pump used the term not, not long ago on, on a, either Nitro or Thunder in reference to Booker T. And, uh, yeah. and I noticed that the production staff tried to blank it out. They missed it, though. Well, Scott Scott Steiner is. is <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's another character no, altogether. No, nobody knows what Scott Steiner is right. going to say anyway. That, that, that's, that's true. But that's, you know, that, but I mean, look at look at. Okay, let's look at a subtle uh, form of racism. Now, I am no fan of seeing men beat up women in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But we can routinely see white men beating the hell out of black women in professional wrestling. Kurt Henning beat up Midnight, was punching her in her breast. Uh, 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 Jeff Jarrett has clocked Jacqueline, Miss Jones, and every other black woman are in sight. Uh, whereas you rarely see a black man do that to a white woman. You did see Rocky do a rock bottom on Stephanie McMahon. We did see the good father put, put a hoe through a table. We did see Viscera splash a hoe. But these white women were hoes and sluts and not necessarily pure, pristine women. And these black women were getting beat down by these men. Jazz was beaten with a Singapore cane by Justin Credible on national television. TNN tried to blank, blank it out, but, you know, obviously that's what it was. That's the well, subtle well, thing. Okay, well, the one thing, though, I, I, I'd say is, is I'm not sure how much of that is racist. In I mean, there's a subtlety to it, but they beat up white women. I mean, there's a misogynistic element in wrestling, period, where... I mean, these promoters have seen, for better or for worse, I mean, the, re the reality is, we've all seen it, that seeing a guy beat up a girl, if it's not done ad nauseum, which it is now. Which it is, yeah. For, yeah, which it is now. But, I mean, the first time, I mean, I remember the first time I saw it, which was ECW, and I was going, oh, my God. And the thing was, it was like, it was it was a 911 choke slamming angel, and, this, and, and the pop was so loud. And, I mean, it was like the beginning, and I remember watching it going like, this is the beginning of something that's going to be really bad because everyone's going to pick it up because the the predominantly you know uh, 18 to 30 male audience for whatever reason loves to see women abused on professional wrestling by guys and Vince Russo caters to that and it's not necessarily a in that case I wouldn't say it's necessarily a racial thing there may be racial overtones to some of it but it's it's more a misogynistic thing, I think. Well, that's why I said it, I agree. It totally is misogynistic. But but that's why I use the term subtle, Dave, because I think if you, if you if we go back to the Dudley Boy thing in in WWF, Devon was holding uh, Alexandria. What's Alexandria York's name? Terry uh, Terry Ball, right? Terry. Terry. He was holding Terry by the hair, and he was threatening to punch her in the face. But he didn't. The, the white, the, the 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 black man never punched the white woman in the face. When Elit Skipper grabbed Major Guns a couple of weeks ago on Lance uh, Storm's orders, he didn't hurt her. That's that's what I'm saying. It's subtle that Jeff Jarrett can clock all these women, including including white women too. But that's that's a more subtle thing. Now, and maybe it's a black thing, you know. We've got a full bank of phone calls. So we're going to start with Chad in North Carolina. Chad, what's going on? Uh, not much, Dave. How's it going? It's going really good. Um, um, first off, did you hear about uh, Shawn Michaels' commentary on his website saying um, that he's healthy, as healthy as he's been in the last two years, and uh, maybe come back for one last match? Yeah, we talked about that a couple days ago. We did, we did hear that. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, if there, if do you think that's a shoot, or do you think it's just something to pull the internet smart? I think he's messing with people. You really do? Yeah. I think you. Well, I mean, maybe someday, but. It was more asking like he was trying to get, you know, it was like he's trying to start something. He didn't, you know, he didn't say, you know, I'm going to come back for a match. It was more like, what would you guys think? What do you think they think? Oh yeah, oh yeah, please, please, Sean, come back. Mm. Uh, I mean, the thing with him, you know, it's, well, you know what? If he came back, he probably, if, if it was only back, one match, awesome. yeah, he'd be awesome if it was only one match. I mean, if he was out there for 200 matches, he'd be a cripple by the end of the year. But, um, you know, for one, I'm sure he could do one match if he wanted to. I mean, we. We talked to Steamboat. You know, he, you know, Steamboat still wants to come back for one last match with Flair. Yeah. You well, know. 
Did he say Blair or Austin at one of the Pillman shows? I mean, I mean, I know I talked to him at one of the Pillman shows, and um, he said he would love to do one last match with Flair, but, you know, just one, you know, because his back is all messed up from all the years. of He had one real bad injury and, and you know, just all the other injuries of 20 years of wrestling. And um, one more thing. Um, about Steve Austin, with the court up in the air, and, and they're moving to um, being in the 25th, um, if, do you think McMahon will still risk um, Austin coming back on... U.S. Um, on TNN and um, on the 25th, and then the next day the verdict come in that they're going back to USA. Yeah, um, I think that Austin's going to debut on the 25th, no matter what. I, I think that he he, he has to because he's going to be on the pay per view the 24th. Uh -huh. So so pretty much there's no point in him once he's on the pay per view the 24th. There's no point in him not being on Raw the next day. Um, I think they need to get whatever storyline they're going to do with Austin off the off the board. You know the timing. You know, the 25th date in the TNN uh, worked well uh, in because Austin was going to come back, you know, to wrestle on October, I believe it's the 22nd, uh, whatever that Sunday is of that week. And and they were going to debut him on the pay-per-view without wrestling on this one coming up. So the timing worked out perfectly uh, for all that. And I, I don't see it. There's no reason to change it. Um, they're just, that whole court thing, that's such a precarious thing right now. Yeah. And um, one last final thing, um, with ECW starting 12 pay-per-views a year next year, uh, do you think if they don't land up, uh, if they don't wind up on USA, that they're they're basically screwed? It's going to be very very difficult. I mean, they'll, I'm sure they, did, they will they get. About, they did the pretty, um, you know, they were pretty consistent before they had TNN. Oh, they weren't going every month though. Yeah, with uh, uh, like the point two, no matter what. Yeah, and they're still. That's really where they are now. They're yeah, still, the with, you know. Yeah, the core ECW fan base. Yeah. I mean, they're point one five to point two two pretty much every time out. They don't vary that much. Yeah. All right, guys. That'll do it for now. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. It's good time. Todd, what's up? Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Very good. Hi, Brian. Hi, Mr. Hey. Schlaz. How are you guys doing? Hey. Um, uh, I have two quick questions for Mr. Schlaz, and I have a quick question for you, Dave. Um, sure. Mr. Schlaz, um, what, the first thing I was asking about is what, what do you think of um, Booker T um, since he's been named the world champion of WCW? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing Todd. Oh, he was just asking, like, what, how, what do you think of Booker T since they first they gave him the title belt? As far as his in-ring performance or? No, no, as, as far as the way he's been characterized. His char the characterization of Booker T. Okay, okay. I, I I always think he has performed pretty much the same way he always has. He gives high energy. He does gives 100% in the ring. I don't necessarily like the bookend. I don't like some of the Rocky-like mannerisms. I don't think it was necessary because, in my view, Booker was over to a degree long before Rocky. So uh, I, I kind of don't necessarily like the way he was presented. I'm glad he got the opportunity, and I hope he'll get it again. I think as far as a portrayal, it's, again, you know, I'm comparing with 80s and 90s, um, and I think the portrayal of, you know, Dwayne Johnson and, and Booker T has, is, is uh, and certainly Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne Johnson, quite frankly, <laughs> To most people, is not even a racial character. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They don't even they don't even think of it. With Booker T, I don't think you know what I don't think people think of it anyway. Because in all sports, I mean, the days of 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 I think the generation of people like uh, you know where where like the Boston Celtic fans loved all those championships, but they never fully accepted Bill Russell. I think those days are long over. I mean, certainly. Michael Jordan would be no more popular. It could be no more popular if he was white. And even like today with 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 Ali, not necessarily Ali in his day, but certainly Ali as as people think of him today, it really wouldn't matter. You know, I think that to the fan base now, uh, the racism. I'm not saying that we're we're a perfect world, but we're. I think the fan base isn't really racist except for a, a minority now. Maybe I'm maybe I'm stupid when I say that. No, you're not. But, no, you're not. Okay. You're right on point. Um, but I mean, it really was. You know, only until, God, the last couple of years, and maybe even less than that. I wouldn't even say the last couple of years, because, God, you know, Mark Henry's portrayal in the WWF even, and that was only a year ago. Um, so it, it, there have been, I think that this year has been a better year as far as portraying characters without the racial mannerisms. I mean, 
the Booker T copying of The Rock, I think, is more just they're trying to get him to copy The Rock. It didn't. It's not. It's not like it's a, a black thing like when we were younger and they did the, you know, the shuffle and the headbutts and all that. You know, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying? Yeah, the bull rope matches and all of that stuff. That, that yeah. I agree with you totally, Dave, because that's what I said. I I said that personally to Booker, and I said that to uh to I've written that in articles. I think it was the fan base that really pushed Russo and and the and the crew over there to finally giving Booker T a chance to run with the title because. Those geniuses, for some reason, decided to turn him into GI Bro, and when he turned into GI Bro, we were just saying there hadn't been anything. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, the fans, the fans, the fan base reacted negatively because even if he had been GI Bill, maybe. But the term, the use of that term "bro" was a racial term that wasn't really necessary for his character. That, he could have <laughs> worn the army fatigue, I thought, but I mean, that, just that term "bro" is what offended people. I'm sorry. That, 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 that uh, that you know the thing is it's it, you know really though it, I, the fan base has accepted it yet we had the whispers I mean just a couple of weeks ago in fact that's the reason they switched the title was those whispers you know and, and it's not from the fans but it was from you know from Kevin Nash that you know he doesn't really get the pop he's supposed to and and you know they took the title off of him the very next week after that stuff started happening but um, um what was it, uh, as far as far as the, the the you know making him the champion I mean it really I, I just keep thinking because of the time frame and, and what they did. I think it's, I think it wasn't so much. The, I think the public liked. I think a lot of people liked it. It was it was something good at the time, but at the same time, I think it was done for the loss. GI Bro or giving him the title. Giving him the title. I think that was done for the loss. GI Bro. I, I don't know what GI Bro was for. Well, uh, that's beyond me. Well, I'm with you, Dave. I couldn't figure out for the life of me why, if you have a racial discrimination lawsuit, why you would do that GI Bro character. Yeah. I could find no logic in that. Well, they did the whole deal about, oh, well, he used to be G.I. Bro, and it was like, well, yeah, that was God knows how long ago. Yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah, longer than that even. But yeah, yeah, even longer, yeah. I mean, in, who cares? In, 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 in uh, Texas, when he was, you know, first broke in, yeah, when... Yeah, and that was a totally different time frame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope I answered the caller's question. I really like Booker's performance in the ring. Uh, I hope he gets another chance. I agree with you, Dave. I think the fans have always accepted him. They accepted the Harlem Heat when they were uh, heel characters because Booker gave 100%. And I don't think it was, it was time to give the title to a black guy because we haven't done it since 92. No, that's not the thing. I think the I think the fans have always responded to him because he gave a he gives a hundred percent. I respond to Big Vito. I'm a mark for Big Vito. I like him. You know, I like I like all characters out there who who who, who impress me. You know, and it's not about race. Todd, is there anything else? Uh, yeah, I, I, can I, I can I just make a quick comment there? Because um, sure. I, I have my own opinion of uh, of it as well, and and I'm not necessarily with you guys completely on that because I I, I think that. Um, in, the, in, in giving Booker T the belt, that it, there wasn't anything there because the guy was as over the character and as, as athletic and good of a wrestler as there was. But what bothered me in terms of, of, of the Booker T, in, in terms of turning him to the rock with, with the, the, the shirts the same and the fa same finishing maneuver and, you know, the catchphrases, is, it seemed like while the rock was, a, a, it was obviously they were copying the rock character, not a black personification, I don't think they would have given that gimmick to a guy or something. And in that, I think it's sort of grouping him. They, they, they said, okay, here's a guy who's a lot different than The Rock. More of a, uh, he's more of an aerial wrestler, Rockler. His, his charisma is a very different type of charisma than Rock. But they said, okay, because this guy is, and the only thing I can come up with is black, because that's the only reason that I can see them linking him to The Rock. Because there, there aren't that many, there are so many dissimilarities between them. That's you're you're right, that is... That is the only similarity between the two of them. <laughs> is, is that one thing? You're, you're right. You're right. And I and I have to say, as far as the thought process of giving him the Rock's gimmick instead of giving Kevin Nash the Rock's gimmick or uh, Gosh Sting the Rock's gimmick, you're, you're, I'm, I'm sure the way the minds th there were thinking that is. You're right. I, I'm sure that's what it is. Because I, 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 could, I couldn't imagine it being anything else. Um, my, my other question for Mr. Spots, whether he thinks that there is a way that the sort of the racism that's existing in pro wrestling, you know, whether more, you know, more um, inherent right now, not necessarily as overt, um, is ever going to be able to die short of a promotion run by, you know, a black promoter. We uh, ever had? Have we ever had like a, a black? I, you know, I can't come up with. It's always been a one, one a run by. 
white men. I can't think of a black man. There have been, you know, Ernie Ladd has booked. There have been black bookers. Yeah. There's, there's never been a major black promoter, has there? I, I oh. still had trouble hearing Todd. I, I thank oh. him for his question. But it was, uh, what was the question totally? Oh, he was just, he was, it was basically a comment saying that uh, he thinks that it may never go away unless okay. we have, like, until until the day where we actually have a, a black okay. promoter. And even with a black promoter, he's going to do, if, if he's about making money, he's going to do what he thinks sells. Now, I, as a promoter, I can understand why they use some of those characters. Do I like seeing Eddie Guerrero doing a Cheech and Chong routine? Absolutely not. Do I like seeing Hispanics called filthy animals? Absolutely not. But I think promoters, uh, their thing is to make money. And any promoter, well, if he's a black promoter, he's going to sell what he thinks will sell. I didn't necessarily like Vito and Johnny the Bull being inept hitmen, but you know because they were Italian. But I think that's that's one of the unfortunate things about it. And Todd is probably right. It probably won't go away to a degree. The difference in professional wrestling. Well, look at tennis. Tennis is selling the Williams sisters. Golf is selling Tiger Woods. Uh, the NFL for years has been selling black wrestlers. As have the uh, black uh, uh, athletes as well as the NBA have been selling black ball players for years. I mean, they just don't say it as openly as professional wrestling probably does. And now, Todd. Um, yeah, one quick question for you. Um, now that now that Austin's back, do you think there do you think that the best route is face face or turning him heel for the Rocket uh, Mania? I think I think it depends, I think it depends on, on how long he's going to be around. Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. If he's only going to be around till Mania, I think that he might as well go out go out with a face face thing. If he's going to be around for like two years, I think or or a year, I think you could go with the, you could go with a heel run and then turn him back for a big farewell. Why not turn Rock? If you want, I wouldn't. Try, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mess with that. Well, we I mean, you, that last time too. Yeah, you can do it, but I, I. I just think Rock is a phenomenon, and I wouldn't. I just wouldn't turn him. I mean, <laughs> I agree. Just, yeah. Hey Todd. Hey, uh, Dave, can I say one more thing about that? Sure, go ahead. Hey Todd, uh, I've, I think you touched on something very important that is, that has also struck me. I think one of the problems with Booker T is that he is a pure baby face in today's society and it's extremely difficult to push a pure baby face because even rocky goldberg austin all of these guys a triple h right now who are getting a lot of cheers they were they're still basically heel characters who fans seem to like kevin nash did it for so many years austin austin was the one everyone talked about austin yeah i mean no, i think that's one of the problems with booker he is a pure baby face in the traditional sense he doesn't smoke. He curses no one out. He doesn't beat up any women. Uh, you know, he's a good guy. I'm doing it for the fans. You know, that, and that's got to be hard, you know, to push. Okay. Well, I'll sign off. Oh, uh, thanks for your help, Bob, um, with my uh, email, Dave. Oh, no, you're very welcome. Okay. Take care, guys. Okay. Uh, I want to make a mention of something before we hit the break. Um, it, it's in your book uh, a little bit about a guy named Luther Lindsay, and I. When I, I know that you know that's a name again. It's a wrestler from fifties and sixties, and a lot of you know a lot of times when when people talk about wrestling, they talk about the all time greatest shooters, and you'll hear about like Carl Gotch or Luthez or wh whatever the names are. A lot of times uh, you don't hear about Luther Lindsay, and um, he, you know. Luther Lindsay had a rep. I mean, I remember people telling me stories about Luther Lindsay that he was right up there with 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 any of them. I mean, he was he he was taught, I guess, by Ruffy Silverstein, who was a great amateur wrestler turned pro, and I mean, you know, an NCAA champion. And it wasn't that long in the training where uh, where um, uh, Luther Lindsay was given a hurt into Ruffy Silverstein, and. Um, I don't know. I just I, I, I just want your, some of your comments of, as far as research you've done on Luther Lindsay. Dave, I'm so glad you you brought that up because when I first started the project, I really wasn't sure how I'd be accepted being more or less an outsider trying to write about the business. But when I started the project, one of the first persons that contacted me was the great legendary Luthez himself. And Luthez said to me, when writing about black wrestlers, do not forget Luther Lindsay because he was one of the best. And when the champion Luthez says that Luther Lindsay is one of the best, I'll just defer to the champ. 
Julian, why don't you tell everyone um, about how to get the book and um, and other things that you've got? Because uh, you actually have a lot of other things. Yeah, the here. book the book is available worldwide at bookstores everywhere, particularly the bigger chains, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, stores like that. Uh, it's, it's online, available at Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble.com. So it's really accessible. It's only fourteen ninety five, very economical. I haven't done Mick Foley type numbers yet, but I'm doing very well with the book, particularly. <laughs> Well, being an independent pro producer. You need to get someone to hit somebody with it on a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, Brian, uh, you know, let me tell you this. This was I had a three-pronged approach in doing this project. First of all, I wanted to call attention to the subject matter that I felt had been overlooked for years and years and years, not only professional wrestling but black professional wrestlers, and I wanted to do it similar to the book you did, Dave, Tributes, you know, and not focus on negatives but focus on the positives of these particular great athletes. Secondly, I wanted to do several national television shows to bring even more attention to the subject. And finally, I wanted to do a documentary similar to Wrestling with Shadows or even similar to the Unreal Story on A&E, something that would be released on the home video market. I haven't completed number three yet. I'm still trying to get that put together. But, yeah, we've been able to really do something. And, and even though the book is called Black Star of the Professional Wrestling, and even though we know a lot of racism exists and sexism and, and my, uh, misogynism, misogynism uh, attitudes are out there. What I wanted to do was really pay tribute to all of these black wrestlers, past and present. And so I haven't been able to get anyone to hit anyone over the head with it yet, Brian, because, you know, I'm trying to be positive about everything. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, what happens is people sometimes bring their own biases into the issue. But anyone who reads this book, they really will enjoy it, and they really will get a lot of uh, background information that they didn't know, like the Godfather being a former McDonald's All-American basketball player, like Paisley being a legitimate I, I, beauty queen who won the Miss Black America. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to tell people, I, I grew up with the Godfather. Right. He used to train at the gym right down the street from here, and uh, we used to train. I, I never, right. I never trained with Charles Wright, and I probably, which is actually funny, I've probably never said a word to Charles Wright in my life, but Charles Wright and I trained for like a couple of hours at the World's Gym in Campbell every morning and the interesting thing is is like his training partners and my training partners and 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 I were friends with him it's just he was just a big quiet guy mm -hmm. um who was <laughs> and for those days he was a big guy yeah. i mean i don't remember there was there were not a lot you of guys were that who were damn dave Meltzer with his dirty he was, teeth that exposed the business i was already that dave Meltzer, but he was nowhere he was years away from being um even um what was the original name that he had bear what was it Le, yeah Le, you know i mean he was years away from ever doing pro wrestling um i mean he was doing um he was a very good college basketball player i mean i mean not college high school he, he played he was a the star high school player in this area and then uh he played college football he went from like 190 to like 300 right before my eyes every morning. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and ended up way over the wrong training partners, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> my training partners got big too, but not quite that big. <laughs> and um and then he, you know, he moved to he moved to Vegas and you know, everyone knew of him, you know, he was bouncing in Vegas at uh for Silver Dollar, I think it was the place. And all of a sudden, one day, one of the guys, who was actually his best friend for years, came up to me and just goes, uh, you know, Chuck, Chuck's doing great in wrestling. You know, he's in Japan. And I'm just going like, huh? And he's just going like, oh, yeah, he's doing great in wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling. And I go... I like New Japan wrestling. You know, he's he's pulling your leg. Yeah. And then it was, and it was, and he didn't know the guy's name. And then all of a sudden, I put you know one and one together, and it was Soul Taker, which was his name in, at that period. And I I had never I had watched Soul Taker. I had seen him wrestle in uh, Memphis, and because he'd gotten so much bigger, I never even knew it was the same person. <laughs> I mean, it's just truth. And That's I, I mean, a great I saw, story, Dave. I mean, I saw him. I mean, like th probably three, four mornings a week all through college, because that was, you know, was when I was in college, and, and he would have been in college because we're ba we're basically the same age. That is great. That is a great story. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I want to mention a couple things before we get back to the calls. Uh, MTV is already advertising WWF Sunday Night Heat on its website at MTV.com, uh, despite no ruling yet. The previous page of Heat on the MTV site says that MTV, MT, uh, that Heat starting when it goes to MTV will be live from WWF New York in Times Square, uh, the biggest stars in music, 
and wrestling for the rowdiest party on the block. There'll be superstar interviews, highlights of TV, behind-the-scenes news and music. So I get the feeling it may be a heavily taped-oriented shows with cut-ins going from WWF New York, as opposed to... Uh, well, they'll probably maybe they'll take like two or three matches on these Thursdays rather than like more of a wrestling type show as it as it sort of is now. So, anyway, that's that. This is that, that um, this is from Nicholas Hecker who says when Jeff Jarrett came to the WWF in his very first quote shoot promo on Raw in Oklahoma City, he complained about being programmed with a black man who can't speak English. Uh, the last time he was in the WWF, which was his program with Ahmed Johnson. Uh, this is. Whatever happened to Panama Jack from the old UWF? Was that, I, I'm sure you mean Savannah Jack. Savannah, Savannah Jack, yeah, UWF. Savannah Jack from the UWF. Uh, he passed away many, many years ago. Right. Only a couple of years after that, um, he had done, uh, uh, in fact, this is like a name that no one really even talks about, um, but he had done a lot of steroids when he was younger, and I, I actually spoke to him several times before his death, and he had a really bad heart. In fact, he was needing a heart transplant, and he told me flat out that uh, he knows it was from steroids. Yeah. Uh, his doctor told him, and he ended up uh, dying of a heart attack. Um, I think he was about 41 years old when he died. Uh, That's right. If I remember. That's right. Yeah. Um, let's go to... Actually, I want to read this because it's actually kind of interesting. It's from Dustin, who says, I was recently in a chat room and made a comment. This would have been a couple weeks ago when, when Booker T and, and Dwayne Johnson were both champions. Uh, the last time that there were two black world champions in the two promotions, the whole chat room started calling me an idiot, a blundering idiot, not just an idiot, a blundering idiot. I thought to myself, they none of them believed that The Rock was black because they always pushed him as a Mavia. I was wondering what your opinions on why they uh, brush his... Um, his race under the rug, and they, they never exploited it. And I think that that was, I think that was his doing. Um, I can't say they brushed it under the rug. I mean, they made it very clear that Rocky Johnson was his father. I mean, that has never been hidden. But you're, um, you're right, Dave. You're right. Oh my God! I know what I know exactly what that guy's talking about being in that chat room. I have gotten heat uh, with my book cover because I have Rocky prominently on the cover of the book, and I don't know why anyone has why people have forgotten that Rocky Johnson has actually was that actually there at WrestleMania 13 in the ring with him. I don't know why I don't know if having a black father and a Samoan mother makes you white. <laughs> or something other than black. I don't know what it is. You know, I'm a black man, but I've never... This is the first time, Dave, I'm going to announce it to you right now. I'm a black man. This is the first time I've ever come out and publicly said I'm black. So what? All you have to do is meet me. You know, I mean, that is ridiculous. Practically, you know, many of us are of mixed heritage. I mean, what difference does that make? I know exactly what that caller is talking about because I've had people look me straight in the eye and say, what are you talking about? The Rock is not black. Well, what is he? What, what kind of foolishness is that? You know, Halle Berry has a white mother. Everyone looking at that lady will call her a, white, a black woman. You know, I mean, what kind of foolishness is that? Wow. I'm Let's sorry, Dave. I'm getting excited now. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We're going to go to Charles in California. Charles, how, how are you doing? Hey, what's Charles. going on, Dave? What's going on, Brian? Mr. Shabazz, it is a pleasure to finally get a chance to speak with you. Well, the pleasure um, is all mine, Charles. I, I, I've read your letters in The Observer, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to get a chance to talk to another African-American gentleman around my age group that grew up in the same area I, I grew up in. Wilmington, That's right. You're from, the, you're from the Carolinas. That's right. Yeah. And I uh, would watch the same stuff and kind of probably have the same sensibilities about, you know, what's going on in, this, in the industry that we both love. Um, I, was, I was listening to some of the other calls and some of the other comments, and I think part of the success of Dwayne Johnson, though, is that he was not stereotypically booked or written as a black character, which is, I think, part of the problem with maybe 90% of the rest of the non-white characters in the industry, uh, you know, they're stereotypically booked and written as ethnic characters. And I think if you, if you have good uh, story-driven and, and character-driven entertainment, race becomes secondary. And, and I think that's, that's something that, that probably needs to happen a little bit more in the industry. Just, you know, guys that are Hispanic, Samoan, Asian, whatever, but not being booked stereotypically in that way. And using them in non-traditional roles, right? And I, and I see the same thing go on in, you know, almost every aspect of escapism, entertainment medium. Whether you're talking, you know, TV shows, sitcoms, uh, comic books, whatever the case. Over the years, most of the times when ethnic characters come up, their horror is it's some white guy writing what he thinks a black, Hispanic, or Asian character is. 
Charles, where are you from again? Uh, I grew up in Wilmington, North Carolina. Wilmington, I live in okay. Los Angeles right now. And okay. I'd love to, after the phone call, if it's at all possible, when we're off the air, ex exchange information with you because I'd love to talk to you about a lot of this stuff further. Charles, you got email? Yes, I most certainly do. My email is awesomerecords at yahoo.com. Give that to me one more time. Awesomerecords at yahoo.com. Awesome spelled like like the guy in the leisure suits. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Like Fantastic. another badly bad character in wrestling. <laughs> it has well, nothing well, to do with race. Well, Charles, <laughs> hey, Charles. Yes, sir. You probably remember, then I know you remember back in 92. Well, Ron Simmons and Butch Reed were, were doomed with Teddy Long. Exactly, yeah. And then when Ron was getting his push by the legendary cowboy Bill Watts, racial uh, g great... Um, great uh, person of uh, race relations that he was, he decided to push Ron Simmons, and I know you remember this as the all-American exactly. Ron Simmons. Exactly. They downplayed his, his racial background and played up his athletic background. Now, I'm not saying Ron didn't deserve the push because he absolutely did. Yes. But uh, that, that, that's the exact point you're making with Rocky. They just didn't play on race as they did with Simmons and, like well, like you said, 90% of all of the other characters of any ethnicity. Yeah, and, and, you know, and you know, Bill Watts took a lot of heat for that because everybody tried to say, well, he's just trying to recreate the junkyard dog, but he, I mean, he was, though. That has, he, he real, I'm not, I'm not saying he, he was, really was. He was, <laughs> he was, but he knew that JYD made a lot of money as Savannah Jack did for him also. Yeah. He had made m millions of dollars with black wrestlers now. He well, knew black Bill wrestlers Watson would you say that, uh, you know, he was talking to some promoter and he had Ernie Lassett next to him and the guy said, well, the Part of the problem here is that you've got too many black faces out there, and Ernie Ladd says, yeah, but the money's green. <laughs> <laughs> but, Ernie, Ladd was, er, Ernie Ladd was uh, Bill Watts' booker who you know, convinced him, I think, to uh, go with JYD. And the other thing that people don't remember is, is JYD had very similar to a Goldberg push in that he beat a lot of guys quick. Not, not, not the one-minute thing like, like Goldberg, but... I mean, it was real important uh, not to, they, you know, they felt it was real important not to beat JYD in certain cities. Um, and, you know, it was, it was just, you know, I mean, they, I don't know, they just really protected him a lot. And they protected him also because 80% of the time they had real good workers with him because one time they, they booked him in the feud with Kamala, who was not a good worker. And uh, JYD lost a lot of steam during that period because <laughs> I, I remember some of those matches, they would just sit there and do nothing. You know, we didn't have Ted DiBiase or somebody like that who was like, I would say was probably like, you know, Orndorff. Those were like his best opponents because they were they were great workers. And uh, like they did the Terry Funk thing, which was uh, when you wrestle JYD, you work a circle around him and just let him stand there and, and give the illusion he's moving. <laughs> uh, Mr. Shabazz, I wanted to get your opinion on this because growing up, in the Carolinas in the 70s, I know for myself, um, during that time period, the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, was like a superhero for us as, you know, young African-American kids. And part of his charm or charisma during that time period was basically he kind of, his interview cadence was kind of stereotypically black. He was kind of doing you know, a lot of people say it was, uh, some of it was Superstar Grant, but to me it was more Thunderbolt Patterson. And Ali, too. He did a lot of Ali, too. Superstar Graham, yeah. Super, yeah it's just Superstar Graham influenced a lot of people. But, Charles, oh, man, you hit the, you hit the nail on the head right there, Charles. Yeah. I, have, I have said that's what I call the Elvis Presley syndrome. Yes. Uh, Thank and, you. And, and it's real. And, it's, and you're right, Charles. Dusty was, hey, man, I still have a, a cup here that I got at McDonald's with Dusty on it, with one with Nikita Koloff. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh, my God, the bull of the wool, you know. I mean, Dusty could do it. Oh, Who man, could we talk got more to talk school better every, than every Dusty Monday. Road. What Dusty did or what Dusty said this weekend. Now, but as an adult and looking back on it, and I look at, you know, the success that Dusty had, and the lack thereof for Thunderbolt, do, do you think Thunderbolt kind of got a, a bad deal out of that? Because I guess one, one of my pet peeves at this point is when, when you take the good aspects of another person's culture and you use them and you achieve tremendous success, but, you know, I, I look at, I, I know a lot of old entertainment entertainers who, you know, they sold their publishing rights in, in their music and stuff, and, you know, they're not living too well. And a lot of people are living very well, basically off of what they did and what they created. And I kind of look at that in a similar vein. What do you think about that? 
I, I agree with you 100%. We, we, we have the same uh, opinion of that. I, I, I did grow up with Dusty, and as I got older, you know, I kind of looked on it a little bit different. But, hey, it, Dusty, even though he was the booker at the time, you know, yeah, he was a hero of mine, too. I love seeing him going at it with Flair and Wahoo McDaniel and all of those guys. But, yeah, Thunderbolt Patterson, I, I think Thunderbolt's own uh, personal um, demeanor, probably held Thunderbolt back in many cases. Thunderbolt did try to unionize professional wrestlers, uh, like Jesse the Body talked about it in the 80s. Thunderbolt actually did try to do it back in the 70s with Alpha the Samoan and some, several other people who worked with him at the time. Um, but uh, guys like JYD, Tony Atlas, today, Rocky, Booker T, certain guys are going to succeed regardless to whatever obstacles they are faced. And yeah. then you have certain guys like uh, uh, Thunderbolt Patterson, like Bearcat Wright, who are really proud individuals and may have a certain demeanor that they're just not going to take certain things. And then you always have, right now, in, in rap music, you have Eminem, you have Kid Rock. The Elvis Syndrome lives in every particular genre of sport, of, of everything in this particular culture. I'm not criticizing. I'm not talking bad about anyone. I'm just uh, stating an obvious, well-known fact. Dave knows it's well-known. It's just rarely talked about and uh dusty did it rick flair did it come on man styling and profiling limousine riding jet flying son of a gun hit stealing wheeling and dealing you know all of that was jive talk yep. now, a couple of weeks ago uh, R vince russo came out and, and called ernest the cat miller dolomite now everyone who's familiar with black comedy knows that dolomite is a character uh, by rudy ray moore who i actually wrote a book about made me wonder if russo was doing research on me but uh <laughs> you know i mean because to hear some of these things that's just you know oh, only, only only if he saw you in a movie last weekend <laughs> well, even, maybe so <laughs> maybe so because I, I could have been in there you know but the you know i mean that's that's what i'm saying that is not a new concept and and it exists all over the place and Dusty was just one of the masters at doing it Jimmy Valiant did it later in yeah, his he career did. Sure Rick did Flair it. Hulk Hogan every, listen if Hulk Hogan does an interview right now in 2000 every other word he says is going to be brother or dude he still yep. sounds like a black guy from the movies in the 70s yep. the problem is is the problem is is that like it, it's that it's so dated now yes I mean, he's doing somebody else's, like, you know, that should be urban slang. I mean, like, you know, because Conan is today's urban slang, and uh, right. and every and a lot of the other guys. And not, not to cut you off, Dave, but I, I, maybe I have a personal bias here, but I give Conan a lot of credit for making that. I mean, Nash was, all, he always had, he was always going to get that female demographic, but when they had Conan in the wolf pack next to Nash, and Nash is wearing the fubu wear, and, you know, doing the urban slang, and even the big papa now, he wants to, you know, uh, do do little takeoffs off off of rap CDs and almost every promo he cuts. To, to me, that that goes a long way to getting those guys over. Um, yeah, well, I mean Steiner, Steiner. The whole thing is, is that like they have. Uh, I think I think Nash probably feeds him up though, feeds him his lines. Yeah, for the most part. <laughs> I mean that's that's the truth. That's the truth. You know, he kind of like because right. th that way that way they kind of protect each other's back, so to speak, and and uh, you know they like they're they're good friends and everything. But um, the um, but yeah, they, I think it's always been. I wouldn't say. In every territory, but it's always been like that 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 kind of black slang uh, influenced the white wrestlers because the whole thing is you've got to be inner city hip, you know. Um, I think is always the feeling because wrestling was always, uh, you know, it, it, it's only until recently that it was a big suburbs thing. It used to really be the inner city thing, you know, like whether it was in New York or or my or Miami, it was kind of like that was the kind of um, that was the kind of fan base that they were appealing to. Interesting. Well, uh, w w la last question, I guess, Mr. Shabazz. What, what, what is your opinion right now on the way, I guess, a lot of the African American, as well as uh, other ethnic uh, wrestlers, are being used? You know, with the lawsuit and everything, you see a lot of guys getting the push in WCW, and even to a lesser degree, maybe in the WWF. I, I kind of one, one that I like, uh, other than Dwayne Johnson, who is the best example, but I like uh, Jonathan Co uh, Coachman, too. He, he's in a non-traditional role for a black guy. You know, he's doing interviews, and he's not sure. really doing it. Okay, uh, the question I was asking uh, Mr. Shabazz is what did he think of, I guess, overall the use of uh, the black, as, as well as other uh, 
ethnic uh, entertainers in the industry today. Um, one example I was looking at um, was I, I like Jonathan uh, Coachman in the WWF because he's in a non-traditional role. He's doing interviews and he's not being really cast in, in a stereotypically black way in any manner. In any way. That's right. I agree with you on that one. That's a very good point about uh, Jonathan Coachman. I, I agree totally. I'm glad to see it. Uh, I am glad that at least at the major level now, what we see on television, the guys are making very good money, at least uh, some of them are on the major level, and at least many of them are getting publicity in ways that they would not have gotten it before. Some, I still don't see as much changes in terms of the uh, characterizations as I would like to see. I mentioned earlier Eddie Guerrero doing the Cheech and Chong thing, uh, the big Vito and Johnny the Bull being inept hitmen for the mafia. I don't necessarily like all the racial stereotypes I absolutely hated here about West Texas rednecks and things like that, but uh, the, bl the black wrestlers, I'm glad to see them out there. Uh, I'm glad to see them making some money. I'm a fan. I'm going to be a fan regardless, and I'll probably sit back and complain about the things I don't like, but the difference is, uh, Charles, like you, I, I have a passion for these athletes. I respect them so much and for what they have done, in, not only in my life, in my children's life, in my parents' lives. I love what they do, and I have so much respect for them. That's why my book, Black Stars of Professional Wrestling, came out. It was born out of love for these black wrestlers. JYD and, and Bobo Brazil passed away in 1998. That's why I wrote the book, because I didn't like the way the mainstream media covered their passings. That yeah. was the impetus for the book. I'm glad to see Rocky doing what he's doing. I'm glad to see Coachman. I'm glad that Vince is, is willing to use black wrestlers, and even over in WCW, even if you have to push them with lawsuits and whatever you have to do, at least they're giving them the shot. And I really like that. I didn't like the Mexicans losing their masks, but uh, at least they're giving them a shot. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that, especially Luchador and Luchador tradition. I think Ray really suffered when, when they took the mask off. Uh, well, I guess that's all for now. There's a lot of other okay, stuff to talk about. Definitely be uh, corresponding with you. Pleasure Mr. talking to you, Charles. Pleasure, man. I've, I've got some more uh, stories for you, so uh, you, you'll be hearing from me. I'm going to be updating this book, so keep the stories coming. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Charles. Okay, we're going to run. We're going to get some more calls in just a second. I just want to make a couple of comments from the emails. Um, this is from Anthony Evans, who's a, a boxing writer, sports writer in England, who says, I find myself agreeing with many of the points raised tonight, but how come Julian Bryan and yourself have not mentioned characters like Lord Al Hayes and Stephen Regal? Are they totally racist, stereotyped English characters? Personally, I don't find offense in them, and I've been waiting for years for WF to give Davy Boy Smith an English football thug gimmick, but a lot of my friends do. I... I used to not like the uh, you know the tea and the crumpet stuff with Regal. Right. Yeah. For that for that same for the same reason that I didn't like the tequila bottle on the pole stuff. And, right. You know, um, even though Regal plays it very well, um, it was it's almost like to me with Re with Regal. I didn't mind the Lord. You know, the Lord stuff in the Blue Blood at all. Right. Right. But but, but the, the almost a waste. The, yeah. The, but but the, the tea stuff for some reason yeah. it like that I think that went over the line. That was more stereotyping. Yeah, and also, it, also to me, it was also like a lack of creativity in that. Okay, we have a guy from England. Okay, and we have, and 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 what we're going to have is, it's like you know, you were talking about how the, how Charles, especially, was talking about. This is how the white man views a black man, and this is what his role should be. Right. And it's like this is what a white American views the world of England that that they're, um, you know, a bunch of guys who drink tea and right. you know talk funny. And yeah. making fun of that for comedy, and they walk funny, and they're kind of pussies and stuff. Even though you know everyone knows Steve Regal's yeah. probably a pretty damn tough guy. Right. <laughs> but uh, let's see. This is also from Chris, who says, "I wonder what you're, what uh, Julian thinks about the most horrible gimmick ever played by a white guy." Actually, I don't think this was the most horrible gimmick, uh, but it was <laughs> it was something, and that was uh, Akeem the African Dream. The oh, my yeah. oh my God! Oh my God! Oh, yes. Oh, with Slick as his manager. Now, you look yeah. at Too Cool today, Akeem really did go way beyond what they did with... I thought they were going to do the same thing with Too Cool, but they didn't go quite as far. But, yeah, with Slick as his manager and wearing the African dashiki, it was no one but the one-man gang. Oh, man, that uh, that blew me away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a couple of people have brought this up. Um and that is as far as uh, Steve Austin. Brian, 
this is actually a pretty damn good idea. They may have even thought of it. <laughs> uh, for, 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 for Austin, how about Shawn Michaels? You know, he's Steve Austin had the last match of Shawn Michaels' career. If Shawn Michaels is going to come back for one match, it'll be it should be at WrestleMania, and it should be in a featured thing. And Austin would be a good guy to have it with, Ooh, and to put Austin good, over again. When you really think about it, though, okay, you'd have Shawn Michaels hit Austin, and then Shawn Michaels is going to come back to do another job for Steve Austin. Oh, it should only be one. They only need to do one, just one match. Get it, you know, over with. It's got to be at WrestleMania. To me, if you don't even do it at WrestleMania, and it's a good thing you put. It, eh, I take that one back because I really think that that Rock and Austin should be the main event at Mania. Well, maybe they could do it at Royal Ru Royal Rumble. No, because Austin would have to win Royal Rumble to get the shot at Rock, unless Austin wins the title. No, they don't even do that anymore. It doesn't even matter. Okay. Remember that year Vince won. <laughs> That's last year, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Not this last year, but the year before. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to Darren in Michigan. Darren, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, Dave? I tell you this now, I mean, you all touched on a lot of studies, which kind of made me a, Um I have a couple of issues that I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to correct a couple of people with Ty. Uh, Booker T was wearing the outfit and stuff before The Rock did because Booker T came out first, but The Rock, since he was pushed more prominently, you know, that's how, this is what we have now. And with Jonathan Coachman, I know, I knew him from Kansas City. I just moved up here from Michigan from Kansas City when he was, uh, broadcaster for KNBC 9 News. And he had met, uh, Shawn Michaels and a few other people from the WWF. That's why he got his position. Hopefully within the next month, I'll be with the WWF as well. So you all keep your fingers crossed. But what I want to know is why, why has Hulk Hogan, I guess, never faced a black wrestler besides Tiny Lister? And I'm assuming he only faced Tiny Lister. Kam Kamala. Oh, oh, okay. Well, because, you know, I, cause I, you know, cause he had me thinking that, you know, he likes black like wrestlers because I know in the shoot, Tiny Lister would probably kick Hogan's ass. And, uh, you it know, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, though. Yeah, well, I, I understand. But, you know, but, but, okay, let's say, for, for instance, Vince Russo and what he's doing with Booker T. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but, me being a black man, don't hate the play, hate the game, and say the drama for your mama. Those are black, those are black terms. I mean, that that's black slang right there. That's the bonics. You know, uh, unless uh, unless he has some hidden motivation, book a teacher and not be doing it because that right there is racist and stereotypical as you get. And nothing do no, nothing doing compared to the rock because the rock don't use. If you smoke what the rock is cooking, you've never heard a black man say that before. You know, and and what he has Booker T doing and coming out and you know it, it, that that's too much comparison for the Rock. And and I saw Mr. Shabazz when he was on BET and, and he asked uh, Booker T about what's the best company to work in. You know, and I mean you have to be a fool to not recognize that the WWF is the number one promotion. Granted, he may be sent it to keep his job or whatnot, or because he was promised <laughs> a loss, you know, a, a title, but you know, come through. But I mean, hey, you, you know, and Kevin Nash talking about Booker T. You know, uh, he's not getting the pops. Well, you can't get a pop if there's only 1,200 people in there, you know, in, in an arena. I mean, if you... If, if <laughs> Kevin Nash is clever, though. Care. What's that? <laughs> you can't if all 1,200 care. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there, there's no way that, you know, that he's going to get... I mean, Kevin Kevin Nash can't even get a pop like The Rock. I mean, you know, I'm trying to figure out who's fooling who. And to me, there's Ruth... Kevin, Kevin Nash is fooling all of them. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, but you know what though? But see, that makes Vince Russo one not only an idiot, but all, but also a pussy. Because if he's in charge and he can't control the asylum, then you know when he loses the job, it's not a matter of if, but it's when. When he loses the job, you know, and I, I don't know. And brother, brother, said a mouthful. Brother. Later. Yeah. How, how did you know about the show on BET? Was there publicity about it? Nah, you know, and, and that's the funny thing about, you know, the Bob Ryder, all of them always talking about how you, you know, how they need to promote. Okay, but I mean, I just had, you know, I just happen to watch Tavis Smiley every night. Right. And so, and, and so I saw it, I'm looking like, damn, you know, what, what happened, you know, cause I know Tavis doesn't, right. you know, doesn't and watch everybody the rest of and their mother knew that Rocky was gonna be at the Republican convention. Thank everybody you. Everybody and their mother knows that China's gonna be on the cover of Playboy. Even before it comes out, <laughs> shirts, they, they, they promote today. their champions. Another thing that has held Booker back: they just do not promote. They don't make their champions household names. Goldberg kinda is an exception, but they really don't go out and actively promote their people to the mainstream in the right way. Like can I, can I tell you something about? Does. Can I tell you something about Goldberg, which yeah. is a real interesting thing, because Goldberg's. Mainstream media success to me had very little to do with WCW, right? And it and it had to do with the fluke exactly. that so many, off of Austin. 
No, it's Joe. No, 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 no. His main, he, he could have been ten times bigger than Austin mainstream media. And the reason is, the reason is, and he was for a while there. And the reason is, is because of the unique thing of there are so many newspaper editors and so many people who have a lot of power in television news that are Jewish, and the idea to them of a news story is right. this unstereo. You know, the Jewish stereotype is something you know unathletic and certainly not a two hundred and ninety pound you know uh, guy who looks like Bill Goldberg beating people up. And it was such a great news story to so many people. That's where Bill Goldberg got over mainstream, bigger than Austin, as far as like you know, Austin never got front page stories in the newspaper. Goldberg got him in many newspapers, um, even though Austin was a bigger star in wrestling. And and, and, you, and that is the point. That is a fact. Goldberg's success was absent of WCW in terms of the mainstream. That is an absolute fact. And, and, and when you had, you had Booker T, you had Ernest the Cat, you had Charmel, who's legitimately a, a former uh, Miss Black America, on a national television program, and you did not promote it. It was a milestone just to have black people talking about black professional wrestlers on national television. Sure. That was a milestone. But they did not lift a finger to promote it, and in their magazine, WCW, they totally ignored me. Now, now, what now I would like, and I'm mad about that. Now, what I want to know is, is why is it that, you know, with all, I mean, you have Booker T. Now, Grant, I know Booker T's loyal, but... There's no way. I, I mean, and that's just because I, I got, I got, I got a, a degree in journalism. There's no way Booker T will ever be as big as The Rock with the type of promotion and, and the type of direction that WCW has. There, there's just no way. I mean, obviously, this event is a, is a marketing machine, and that's why I'm trying to work there. But, I mean, there, there's just no way. I, well, hey, send, hey I, I mean, don't forget to send him a oh, after I got a letter of recommendation from the President of the United States. That's all I need. But, <laughs> okay. you know, hey, you all lie, but I'm dead serious. Uh, I mean, but you know why? Why? Why WCW? You have Mark Madden trying to use his Cisco reference and trying to trying to speak slang. And he said a comment the other day to me that which was a racist comment it had nothing to do with Luke Evans and nothing like that. But he made a comment in one of the matches, and I have to probably call you tomorrow and look at the tape again and tell you what it was. Oh, and, 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 Darren, we got to get running because we're totally out of time. Yeah. And Julian, Julian, we got to get you back on like in a couple of weeks and finish this up because there's a lot more to talk about on the subject. And we are not going to be here tomorrow. I just want to let anyone know it's a tape with Stan Lane. And Monday, we're going to be back with Jim Cornette, which should be another very lively discussion of a totally different order. So anyway, Brian, I want to thank you. And Julian, I want to thank you very much. And we'll see you on Monday after the WCW pay-per-view.